What's the connection between the heart and the small intestine in Chinese medicine? Why is the gallbladder located both in the young organ category and in extraordinary ones as well? And why do the yin organ seems to have more function or many more functions than the young one? Well, I'm going to answer all those common questions today in the Zone 4 Organ Theory According to Chinese Medicine Foundation, Part 2. If you haven't watched Part 1 yet, the link is located below this video. Welcome back to my channel. If it's your first time here, I'm Clara from Acupo Academy, and I create Chinese medicine and acupuncture contents for students and practitioners, making it easy to grasp and fun to learn. When I talked about the Zong Fu organ in part one, which is located below this video, if you want to watch part one, I talked about all the yin organ, the heart, the lung, the kidney, the spleen, the liver, and their function and how we look at them in Chinese medicine perspective. Today, we're going to talk about the young organ and the extraordinary organs as well. We're also going to look at the relationship between the Zong organ or the Zong Fu organ, I should say, and the vital substances. By the way, I also did a live on the four vital substances, which I think are so important to look at in perspective of Chinese medicine, qi, blood, body fluid, and essence. So looking at that relationship with the zong organ, putting it all together, because foundation is where once we understand TCM foundation, then we know for sure that we can help our patients, we can make a diagnosis, we can come up with a treatment plan. It's all about going back to foundation. Once we know our foundation well, everything makes sense and it's all put together. So today in part two, we are going to continue our journey down the Zong Fu organ theory according to Chinese medicine. Let's do this. The Zong organ have their pertaining partners, which are the Fu organ. However, we did not talk about the pericardium in the first part of the Zong Fu organ video that we did. I'm going to talk about the pericardium in this one, even though it's a Zong organ or Yin organ, I wanted to connect it to the San Zhao and talk about their connection and talk about what the pericardium brings to the table in Chinese medicine. So I just wanted to preface this. So the Yang organ or the Fu organs are the stomach, the large intestine, the small intestine, the gallbladder, the urinary bladder, so I will call it the bladder because urinary bladder to me is way too long, and the San Zhao, or the triple warmer, triple burner, triple heater, energizer. There's so many words. I like to keep it Chinese because the translation changes with every book, and that is confusing to me. So I'd rather keep it as the San Zhao and keep it as the Chinese pertaining words because it doesn't have a specific organ that is within our cavity or organ cavity in our body. So that's why I like to keep it more in the Chinese perspective. So we're going to look at each of those functions, which are much less than a yin organ, but we're also going to look at their relationship with the pertaining yin yang organs because they work really well together. Also, another thing that I want to you know mention is the Zong organ versus the Fu organ, I think the Fu organ have a big, big, I think, function with the meridian themselves. So the, if you look at the gallbladder, it doesn't have a lot of function as a organ, and that's a TCM organ, but as a meridian, it's so powerful, right? And it's the same with the small intestine or the San Zhao or the large intestine or the stomach, right? Their function is not many function, just like their counterpart, the yin organ, but their meridians are very powerful in uh, addressing indication, function, and helping the body get into balance. Okay, so let's start it up. So let's start with the stomach. The stomach is kind of like the odd one out a little bit in the yang organ. And the reason is, if you look at yin and yang perspective, and when we talked about the yin and yang theory in the previous videos a few weeks ago, we talked about this, how the front of the body is yin, the back of the body is yang, the lateral side is yang as well, just like the back, but the medial side, what's closer to the midline, is more yin. So what's interesting is all yang meridians are either located at the back or on the lateral side, except the stomach. The stomach is located in the front. So although it is a young meridian and a young organ in TCM, it is almost like a yin 
it is the most yin of all yang organs because it has such a powerful function. First of all, it is in charge of processing fluids and generating fluids. So this is really important because without fluids, we can't live very long, right? So we need the stomach to be able to generate fluid and transport fluid as well. It is going to be ripening and rotting, that's the translation, the food for digestion. So basically it's the beginning of digestion. It's the same as the entity of the stomach that we have. It has the same function. So that's its function. Now what happened to the food? The food we eat gets into the stomach. The stomach will start ripening and rotting the food and then the spleen is going to take the nutrients and distribute it and transform it to distribute it all over the body. The rest of it is going to go down to the small intestine for more purification, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the small intestine, which will continue to go down to the bladder and large intestine for more work until it, it's excreted, body fluid and obviously uh, stools and solids. So that's the beginning of digestion. Now, what I love about the stomach and the spleen is that to me, they have the perfect yin yang relationship according to chinese medicine because they are completely opposite the stomach chi when it's healthy goes down right if it's unhealthy it goes up and we have nausea we have acid reflux vomiting etc the spleen on the other hand when it's happy and healthy it raises clear chi to the head and it keeps the organs from falling down so it goes up when it's unhappy or unhealthy, the spleen goes down and we are very tired, exhausted, chronic fatigue, and maybe even prolapse of organs. So see how they're completely opposite. Second, the spleen has tendency to be affected by dampness, so excess body fluid, and by cold. The spleen does not like cold. The stomach is the opposite. It does not like heat. It gets affected by heat. Stomach fire is a big one. Stomach heat is a big one. And then by dryness. This is why it generates fluid. And if it's too dry, it has problem with, and then we have thirst. Thirst is usually always a stomach problem. So it could be stomach fire, stomach heat, or stomach yin deficiency when we're thirsty because stomach generates fluid. So very much dry and heat affects the stomach, but cold and damp affect the spleen. So see how very much opposite, which is really cool because they work really well together. However, digestive system is at the center of our health. And because the spleen and stomach are such opposite, if there is a lot of cold affecting the spleen, for example, and we eat a lot of warm food, it might be too warm, too hot, too fast, and now the stomach has too much heat, and now we have excess heat in the stomach. Vice versa, if the stomach has a lot of heat and we want to cool it down with cooling food, cooling formulas, we have to be careful because it might make the spleen too cold, right? So it's a fine balance between the two and that's why diet and talking about health and how we eat our eating habits makes a huge difference. It takes time, consistency, but it's really at the center of balancing our whole health. So I love that connection. Let's look at what I talked about when we first started this video. It was like, what's the connection with, between the heart and the small intestine? Because really, where is the connection? When I was back in school, in TCM school, I had a really hard time understanding why the heart is connected to the small intestine. What does it have to do with anything? So, first of all, we're going to talk about what the function of the small intestine is. And the main function is to separate the clear from the turbid. So when I talked about the stomach earlier, I said the stomach ripens and rottens the food and then sends the rest to the small intestine for more purification while the spleen grabs the nutrients and starts distributing them all over the body for energy specifically, for muscle, for energy in general. Now, when the small intestine receives the food and fluid, so the solid and fluid from the stomach, it furthers uh, clears and separate the clear from the turbid. So it furthers uh, purification. Now the clear, it's going to go and be redistributed to the body as well, to the spleen and the lung to get to the skin as well, because we want to make sure we have a, a skin that's moistened. Now the unpure or turbid, which is often called turbid, is going to go down to the large intestine and down to the bladder. So the solid are going to go to the large intestine 
and then the liquids are going to go to the bladder and the bladder is going to excrete it as urination and the large intestine is going to excrete it as solid or stools. That's how it works. So it separates the clear from the turbid as a function in the physical aspect. In the emotional aspect, and this is where things are going to get connected, the small intestine also separates the clear from the turbid. And what does that mean? It is the ability of having clear judgment and being able to separate right from wrong, right? We all know there are lines about opinion and belief. That's fine. But right and wrong, we all know there is obviously things in life that are either right, either wrong, right? So that is just if someone is going out of the way to kill somebody else, that is wrong. We understand that. We understand that. Now, when I have patients, um, there are patients that are kind of on the fine line of not being able to have clear judgment to see what's right from wrong. So for example, when I see a patient that is in an abusive relationship, doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, they're with a partner that's abusive in their relationship. It could be physically or emotionally or both. But that person is excusing and saying, oh, but they love me, but it's okay because I'm, I'm not, you know, it's my fault. I did it. I created this, this atmosphere. It's all my fault. They're not wanting to leave the relationship because they are not seeing what's right from wrong, right? And so that's obviously the person that's abusing them knows exactly how to mold that behavior. They know how to control that behavior, right? But in order to look at this, it is a small intestine issue, not being able to separate the right from the wrong. Make sense? So when it comes to the connection between the heart and the small intestine, there's two things. On the mental aspect, as you know, the heart is in charge of all our emotions, all our clear thinking, with the spleen sending clear chi to the head. So when the small intestine is not able to separate right from wrong, there is phlegm in the brain. There is phlegm in the heart, right? If someone is going to take a gun and start shooting at everybody, there is phlegm in the brain, right? There is an imbalance because the person is not seeing this as wrong right? There is no right from wrong understanding in that perspective. So there's a mental health aspect that's affecting the heart mind. That's the connection. The second one is when there is heart fire, it can move down to the small intestine and affect the small intestine and create fire in the small intestine. How does that show? Often that shows with interstitial cystitis. So cystitis is an inflammation of the urethra and the ureter that creates really painful urination, uh, maybe even blood in the urination, but the person does not have an infection. And I see a lot of women with IC uh, in my practice over the years, and every one of them have insomnia. They don't sleep well for many years. So that affects the small intestine. And often we use a point like heart five. Heart five is the lower connecting point of the heart to the small intestine. And that's a great point you have when there is interstitial cystitis. Isn't that cool? I love Chinese medicine. Woo! The large intestine function in Chinese medicine is pretty simple. It is the organ that lets go. So it excretes the stools, right? And uh, we have a bowel movement, we excrete the stool and we're done with. So it's pretty simple, not many function. That's its physical aspect is emotional aspect is to let go, the ability to let go of something. So when we repress something or we have a lot of emotion that is stuck inside and we're not letting them go, a lot of time that can come up as constipation that is chronic. I had a patient who came to see me a few years ago and she had a bowel movement every 10 days, three times a month and three times a month was a good month. And I was blown away because we all know we need to have more than, you know, three times a month. We need daily bowel movement to excrete the stool. So obviously her large intestine wasn't working. However, she did all the physical that she needed to do. She had colonoscopy, she had endoscopy, she had so many MRI, all the tests because she's had that problem for years and nothing physically could come out of it, right? And when I looked at the way she ate, she ate a lot of fiber, she drank a lot of water, she exercised, she was trying to do everything in order for her bowel to actually move and be peristasis happen. 
but it wasn't happening for her. So if it's not physical, it has to be emotional. And that's what I told her. I said, if it's not physical because you did all the physical aspect and you did everything that you needed to do, but they can't find anything wrong, then it's emotional. And I said to her, if you are holding on to something for many, 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 many years, you need to process it, address it, and get some help in order to let go. And when you let go, then the large intestine starts to let go as well, and bowel movement will get better. So, of course, with acupuncture, I can help, but it will be temporary, right? Every time she came for treatment, she would have a couple of bowel movements for two days in a row, and then it will go back to no bowel movement or constipation. But the thing is, if we don't look for the root cause and address it, then then we're just managing, right? That's why we need to always look for the root cause. So this was an example that, you know, was very pertinent to TCM perspective. She said to me she does and did have trauma she needed to deal with, but she was very fearful about going into it. Fair enough, right? But she started going to counseling and she started going to process the trauma. I don't know what the trauma was. She never told me about it. And, you know, things started getting better and better and better. So it takes time, specifically if it's been there for a long, long time or many years. Now, the relationship between the lung and the large intestine is twofold. The first one is the immune system. The lung is in charge of the defensive chi, the immune system, and so is the large intestine because in the physical organ, we have probiotics, which are fighting invaders, which are fighting bacteria, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing that's connecting the two is the skin. They both manifest on the skin, and this is part of the five element theory, right? When we talked about the five element, both large intestine and lung manifest on the skin. So when someone has a lot of constipation, it might come out on the skin with zits or eruption or cystic acne, right? It could be a hormonal. I'm not saying this is what happened every time you have a zit. But I'm going to tell you a story that's really interesting, for example. So I moved to Canada from France many, many, many moons ago, because now I'm in my late 50s. Oh my God, time flies. Anyway, when I was from France, born there, I ate bread, of course, I ate baguette and croissant, and I was born with that kind of stuff, right? So I moved to Canada, and I have to tell you, as a teenager, I never ever had a zit or acne at all, ever, in my life. Then I moved here, I'm in my 30s, and within two years of being in Canada, I started having massive cystic acne, like a lot of acne, really, really painful, and I was just like, what is happening to me? So I went and had my hormone checks. Everything was fine with my hormones. I'm like, I don't understand. And it lasted quite a long time until I figured out that the gluten or the wheat in North America is processed completely differently than in Europe. And my gut, my large intestine was like, no, 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 I don't like this. And that created inflammation. It took two years for the wheat that I was eating here to create massive inflammation in my large intestine. So I thought, okay, well, let's stop the wheat and see what happened. Within a month, my whole skin cleared, completely cleared. See how the large intestine and the skin, right? And then I remember the first time we went back to France with my husband after I went gluten-free, he said to me, what are you going to do when we go to France? And I said, I don't care if I look like, you know, I have zits all over. I'm having baguette. I'm having croissant. I'm going to have everything. Nothing happened. When I was in France, nothing happened. Anywhere I've been in Europe, nothing has changed my skin. Here, if I have a little piece of cake at a birthday party, the next day I wake up and I have a zit right away. So obviously it's processed differently. But the point here is that in my large intestine, is telling me something on my skin. That's the relationship between the long and large intestine. Love it! Let's look at the gallbladder. So the gallbladder, as I said earlier, is in two categories. So let's talk about this category, which is the young or the foo organ category. The gallbladder is function is to store bile. Right? So it is one of the rare young organs that doesn't deal directly with food, as you can see, because it stores bile. The second function of the gallbladder is to be in part, or not be in part, is to allow good decision making, self-esteem, and no self-doubt. So it's really about self-esteem, no issue with self-doubt, and the ability to make decisions 
right? So it's also in charge of better movement with the liver, specifically tendons, sinews, ligaments, and allowing better flow and better movement within the body. Now, when it comes to the uh, decision-making, this is so easy when you are in clinical practice. If you want to know if you think the person has gallbladder meridian or gallbladder issue in general, it's super easy. You ask someone, not right away, but you know, you ask them a bunch of questions, and eventually when you get to the mental health piece, you can start asking more questions. And I usually ask people, do you make decisions easily? And they'll go, well, huh, I don't know. Oh, I guess not. Ha ha ha. We laugh, right? So if people, when you ask them questions during the consultation and they have a hard time making decisions when I'm like, hey, do you sleep well? Hmm. Well, I don't know. It's like you can't even answer a simple question. So let's ask and see if those people can make decisions. That's a gallbladder being stuck. Often those people go, go to bed between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. And so if you go to bed between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., which is gallbladder time, you are going to have a hard time making decisions. You're going to have more self-doubt and, for a lot of people, more self-esteem issue. So we want to go to bed before 11 p.m., yes? Okay. Now, the um, liver-gallbladder relationship is very simple. You know, when we have a lot of tension on our shoulder, this is where gallbladder 21 is. One of the best points when we have traps or trapezius muscle that is so tense and tight because we have a lot of stress. As we know, liver is affected by stress because liver moves chi all over the body, allowing us to be relaxed. When we are stressed, shoulders tighten, and that's the gallbladder meridian that we can utilize to relax the shoulder. This is a great trigger point to relax all that tension up in the upper tracks, right? So that's also another point that we use is gallbladder 34, which is one of the best point for influential point of the sinews, tendons, ligament, and joints. This is the best point when there is issue with the joints. So that complements the liver very, very well. Make sense? I know, I, I love those two together because also when we have temporal headaches, which is often due to stress, right? At the end of the day, people are like, oh, I have a temporal headache, and we know it's liver yang rising. The best points are going to be around the gallbladder meridian, which goes on the temporal area. We are going to use the gallbladder, and absolutely like gallbladder 41, gallbladder 40, distal point to allow a temporal headache to be relieved. So see, they work really well together. I think those two together. Let's look at the bladder and the kidney. So we know this because it's easy. In the Western sense, the bladder excretes the fluid that we don't need through urination, right? So it basically is in charge of transforming the fluid and excreting the fluid. So that's pretty simple. The other side of the urinary bladder, the mental aspect of it, is in charge of letting go but differently from the large intestine. From the large intestine, it's emotionally upset, emotional things we can't let go. With the bladder, it's more connected to jealousy, envy, and holding a grudge. So I'll tell you a story because I think it's very funny. My mother had a, a really, really good friend's best friend for 40 years in my hometown in the French Alps. They were friends for a long time. And then in her 60s, my mother and her friend, what they would do is they would go to each other's house and they would put the rolls in their hair, right? And put the roll all over their hair. And then the next morning after you wake up, you take the rolls out and you brush your hair and you look very pretty. This is very old style, but that's what they used to do. So one day my mother says to her friend, she says, hey, can you come and put the rolls in my hair because tomorrow I'm going to the doctor and I want to look good for the doctor. This is very French. <laughs> so her friend says, no, I'm too tired today. I don't feel like coming. I don't want to come. And my mom's like, but I need you to come and put the roll because I'm going to the doctor. This is important. I want to look good. And her friend's like, no, I'm too tired. So my mom says, so you're not going to come and do it. And her friend said, no. She goes, fine. My mom hang up the phone, 40 years of friendship. She held a grudge to her friend, never talk to her again. Oh my God. My mother, I love my mother, but she was very unique and she would never forgive you. She would get upset and she would never forgive you. So I remember maybe like in her 80s, one time I saw her friends in town and I said, hey, I saw Marie Lou. And she goes, oh yeah, I I'm mad at her. I'm never talking to her again. I said, yeah, 
why is that? Why are you not talking to her? And she says to me, I don't know, I don't remember what she did to me, but she did something. So she was still holding a grudge. She didn't even remember why or what happened. My mom had so many bladder issues. Interesting, right? Obviously, as we get older, the bladder gets weaker and there's incontinence and other issues, but that was interesting to see. So holding a grudge uh, happens a lot to a lot of people, specifically older people. Now, that has nothing to do with age, envy and jealousy. For people that are envious and jealous all the time, it does affect their bladder and they will get more issue with the bladder. Watch this in clinical practice and see the similarity and you'll, fee, you'll be amazed at how true that is. So that's the bladder itself. The bladder and the kidney work very well in transforming fluids and excreting fluid because of course the kidney is in charge of water metabolism in the lower jaw like we talked about when we did part one of the Zongfu or again last week, right? So the, the kidney and the bladder work really well and they get affected by fear. And it's easy to see because when there is a fear or shock, the person can have bladder incontinence, right? Or lose bladder control. So that's the fear affects both of them. And that's their relationship in that perspective. Okay, so now let's talk about the Sun Zhao. The Senjo is always confusing my students because we can't relate it in our mind to a physical organ. And I think that makes it a bit difficult. And again, like I said at the beginning, San means three, Zhao means heater, cauldron. I don't know. It's like a pot full of hot water. That's what I, I see it as that. But the San Zhao is often translated as the triple burner, triple warmer, energizer, heater, it's like so many translations, so I'm going to keep it as the San Zhao because it makes so much more sense because it's an entity that's a bit different, right? Makes sense. So the San Zhao is often compared to the lymphatic system because it's in charge of draining fluid and processing fluid in the upper jaw, middle jaw, and lower jaw. And remember the upper jaw, we had the heart, sorry, the heart and the lung, and the lung was in charge of processing fluid in the upper jaw the spleen in the middle jaw, and the kidney in the lower jaw, when we talked about this in the zone organ. So the San Zhao is kind of like the pot that has all the organs in it, and it helps really process all the fluid. This is why often it's connected to the lymphatic system. Also, remember that the San Zhao time is from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and that's when you're supposed to put all your organs to sleep. In summer, you can go to sleep a little bit later, in winter a little bit earlier, but the San Zhao time is, because the San Zhao is in charge of connecting all the organs when it comes to fluid metabolism, this is when we're supposed to go to bed. Make sense? Okay. The San Zhao gets affected mainly by damp heat. Too much dampness, too much heat. And we're going to look at it in a second, right? Now, also, the San Zhao and the pericardium, let's talk about that connection. So I did not talk about the pericardium when I talked about the zone organ in video part one. So I'm going to talk about it right now. The pericardium is the protector of the heart, right? Peri means around, right? And cardium means the heart. So it's around the heart. It's the protector of the heart in the physical aspect because the pericardium function is to have great blood flow and blood circulation. But it's also mental aspect to protect the heart from being affected emotionally very deep. So, for example, we know pericardium 6 is one of the best points for anxiety, and that is trying to calm the mind so the anxiety doesn't create insomnia, which eventually affects the heart, right? So, that's the relationship of the heart with the pericardium. However, the pericardium meridian, I think, sometimes is more used. Pericardium 7, for example, is a ghost point, and it's the best point to soothe a broken heart. So for someone that has their heart broken by a relationship failing, by maybe someone that passed away, your heart is broken, pericardium 7 is the best point to soothe it. 
right, to help process the event that happened and broke your heart. And so that's what I'm talking about. Like Pericardium Meridian is so much, it's a great complement to the Heart Meridian. And we use it a lot in clinical practice. Now the Pericardium and the Sanjiao connection, as you can see in here, it is, their connection is very much more mental than physical or emotional versus physical. And you can see it affects together, they affect the person's capacity to relate to other people in the external world, so outside of themselves. So when people have a really hard time with being in the crowd, being with a lot of people, feel really anxious when there's too many people, that's Sanjiao and Pericardium not properly connecting or working together. Does that make sense? Now the Sanjiao also allows for Yuan Qi, the source Qi, to circulate all over the body. And that's really important as well. This is why we can use the Sanjiao Meridian and the Sanjiao Points for many functions in the upper jaw, middle jaw, and lower jaw. For example, Sanjiao 6, best point on the Sanjiao for constipation. That is the lower jaw, right? When there is constipation, specifically when there's not enough fluid, Sanjiao 6 is one of the best points when there's heat in the large intestine. Right? But Sanjiao also can be used not just for like digestive system issue, but can be used for um, tinnitus. It can be used for shoulder tension. It can be used for face issues like uh, Bell's palsy. It is so many, many things that the Sanjiao can do because it is helping the Yuan Qi, the source Qi, circulate throughout the body. So it connects to all the 12 Yuan Qi points. This is really important. So the San Jiao, as you can see, has the upper jaw, which is where the lung and heart is, the middle jaw, where all the digestive system is, and then the lower jaw, which is everything below the belly button. So I'm going to talk about those in a minute. But basically, it's all relating to the fluid and how we can expel fluid. So this is, each jaw can have a lot of damp heat. If you have damp heat, for example, in the middle jaw, you have heat in the stomach and damp in the spleen. Because remember, the stomach gets affected by heat and damp in the spleen. So now it takes a while to get rid of this because you have to dry the dampness, but you don't want to create more heat because heat has a tendency to dry the stomach, right? So this is a fine balance and it takes time. And it, there's a lot of formulas out there that are great because they're balanced to be able to do this as well. With acupuncture and diet, it takes a little bit longer. If that makes sense, right? So damp heat can affect the upper jaw, and that would be phlegm heat. When you're coughing a lot of phlegm, or someone has chronic bronchitis or emphysema, there's a lot of phlegm up here, but it's affecting the heart as well, right? Because when there's long issue for a long time chronically, the heart will be affected. The lower jaw, if we have damp heat in the lower jaw, for example, it can affect the bladder with bladder infection. It can affect the large intestine with, let's say, colitis. Colitis, for a lot of time, not always, but the main pattern is damp heat in the large intestine, right? It's smelly diarrhea, which is excess damp heat. Make sense? So that's how we look at it. I wanted to look at um, each jowls and talk about each organs within the jowls, right? So you can see the lower jowl, the middle jowl, and the upper jowl. So when it comes to, oh, no, I went way ahead. When it comes to the upper jowl, lung and heart, middle jowl, spleen and stomach, lower jowl. Now think of the tongue. The back is the lower jowl, right? The back has the bladder, the large intestine, the small intestine, and the kidney. Same for the lower jowl. However, the liver and the gallbladder on the tongue is on the side. In the San Jiao, where is the liver and gallbladder located? Some books are going to say it's located in the middle jowl with spleen and stomach. Some books is going to say it's located in the lower jowl with kidney, bladder, small intestine, and large intestine. So where do we put the liver gallbladder? Well, in my opinion, and my pearl and clinical practice and the way I connect it to this, is if the liver or gallbladder organs, physical organs, are affected, I will use the middle jowl, and that's how I'm going to allow him to connect to the middle jowl. However, remember that the meridian, the liver meridian, for example, the lower collateral of the liver meridian starts at liver 5 and rises up to the external genitalia, wraps around the external genitalia. 
The main liver meridian also wraps around the external genitalia. The gallbladder goes right through the hips, the inguinal region, so all that lower part, and it affects a lot of issues in that lower part. So for example, we use the gallbladder 41 when we want to relax the hips during pregnancy. Or we use liver 5 when there is external genitalia outbreak, like herpes outbreak. So if it is a meridian problem, in my mind, I put the liver and gallbladder in a lower jaw. So I don't connect like one or the other. It depends if it's an organ or a meridian. That's how I see it. Doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. It just means it's a different perspective, right? And so we were taught it's either one or the other. Pick. And <laughs> I didn't pick. I just try to relate in my mind how it would uh, affect my patients and how I would go about it. Make sense? If you look at liver 13 or liver 14, for example, great point when there is digestive system issues, right? Because, because uh, liver 13 is the front move point of the spleen, or physical organ of the liver issue with liver 14 because it's the front move point of the liver. So that, to me, is an organ issue, it's the middle jaw. However, if I looked at the meridian, then I'm using different point because it's affecting the external genitalia or the low inguinal hip region. Make sense? So that's how I connect the upper middle and lower jaw. So let's talk about the relationship of the Zongfu organ with the four vital substances. And then we'll talk about the six extra organ. That is really important because in clinical practice, we have to see when there is blood issue, let's say blood stasis, uh, blood deficiency, when there is blood issue, which organ system should we look at? Well, spleen produces blood, liver stores blood, and heart circulates blood. So when there is blood issue, we have to look at those three entities. That's the connection here, right? Blood stasis happen only to liver and heart. And blood deficiency can happen to liver, heart, or spleen, or all three of them. And we have great formulas that really address those issues. So it's looking at the four vital substances, qi, blood, body fluid, and essence, and their connection to all the zongfu organ. When we look at qi, for example, it is going to be connected a lot more to lung, heart, and spleen. Doesn't mean it's not connected to the other one, but as an entity, it's very much close to Breathing in, breathing out, this is qi, right? Good air qi. Then we have also food qi that is digested by the spleen and stomach. And also the heart affects the speech, right? The ability to speak, which is very much a lot of qi. When I talk in this video a lot, I'm losing a lot of qi. I'm giving a lot of qi, right? So I know after that I have to be by myself and not talk for a couple of hours and take a break because I'm bringing a lot of qi from the heart from speaking, coming from the throat. It's also a lot of long chi. That's why often singers that overdo it, like Celine Dion, who has worked so hard all her life and sings for you know days and days and days and does concert for you know weeks and weeks on end because that's what she does, depletes her heart and lung because she overdoes it, right? In the voice perspective, even though she is strong voice because she had developed it, um, it's overdone. That makes sense? Okay, the other one is looking at body fluid. So body fluid, we said that when we talked about the Sanjiao and also water metabolism organs. And back in the Zong organ, we talked about the spleen, which is in charge of really water metabolism in the middle jaw for bloating or preventing bloating. The kidney in the lower jaw, right? And then the uh, lung in the upper jaw to be able to not have swelling of the face or to bring really good fluid to the skin which the lung is related to. So that's where we look at if there's water metabolism issue, we look at it. And I have a question that comes all the time, which is, well, I have dryness in my skin, however, I'm always bloated and puffy, right? So I have dryness and dampness, how is that possible? Oh, it's possible. So what happened with this, this is the Sanjiao issue, is that you have enough fluid in the body, but it's not distributed properly. So it's accumulating in one area with, let's say, lots of bloating or water retention, but it's not nourishing the skin, and so the skin is all dried up. So the problem is there is enough fluid, it's just not reaching the area it's supposed to be at. This is when we want to use the Sanjiao meridian along with the lung for the skin and the spleen 
for metabolism of, let's say, bloating, if that's the example we're taking. Make sense? And the last vital substance is essence, right? That's what's been given to us at birth. So the essence is connected a lot to the liver because the liver gets affected by stress. And there is nothing bigger, I think, in my opinion, to age faster than the amount of years and years and years of stress that a person can be uh, subjected to. Right? People dismiss stress all the time, but it's one of the most aging factor is stress. The second aging factor is diet, right? If we put really bad food in our body, we don't nourish our body, we're gonna age faster. So yes, sleep is also important as well, but sleep gets affected by stress usually, right? When we're really, st really stressed, we can't sleep. So stress comes from liver being affected and diet. Diet affects the aging system, which depletes essence. And kidney, of which course, of course, is at the root of our essence. It's what carries essence and was given to us at birth because it's in charge of aging, growth, reproduction, conception. So kidney strength is also going to keep us, you know, uh, aging well, I guess, for the essence perspective. So that's the connection. As you can see, just like when we talked about the five elements a few weeks ago, in that video, we talked about the cosmological sequence. And we said spleen and stomach, or the earth, was at the center. Well, it's the same thing here. As you can see, the digestive system is at the center of keeping chi, blood, body fluid, and essence in really good health. It's at the center of everything. That's why eating habits makes a huge difference in our overall health. And we always have to talk to our patients about their eating habits and diet. It has to be part of your treatment. Even if someone comes to see you for chronic shoulder pain or chronic back pain, we think, oh, it's musculoskeletal, skeletal. I don't need to worry about it. But we do because in order to decrease inflammation faster to relieve the pain, we need to have a diet that nourishes the body, not create more inflammation. That's why turmeric, for example, or ginger are anti-inflammatory and relieve pain. Make sense? Yay! <laughs> okay, so I got a question. How to differentiate if sweating is due to lung or heart problem? Yeah, so that's a good question. Heart is in charge of sweating, but lung is in charge of opening and closing the pores, right? So they are going to work together. They're never separated. So if there is lung chi deficiency and the person has no ability to close or open the pores, we're going to have more of an issue with um, that's going to show up when we have external pathogen invasion. That is going to be much more uh, prevalent at that time compared to a chronic uh, sweating, for example, over sweating during the day or at night, that's more of a heart problem. So if it's acute, I would say it's more of a lung problem. If it's chronic, it would be more of a heart problem. And then maybe we can, uh, we can answer that. Okay, Martin? Perfect. Okay, so now let's talk about the six extraordinary organs according to Chinese medicine. So we can't bypass them because they're so important. They're extraordinary. When I teach students, Every time I start talking about Dung Fu organ and I talk about the yin and yang organ, people are like, where's the brain? I'm like, it's coming. <laughs> where's the brain? It's coming. Where's the pancreas? The pancreas is part of the spleen system in Chinese medicine, so that's a question I get often. So the six extraordinary organs are the uterus and the dantian, which is the male counterpart of the uterus, which is basically the female and the male reproductive system, the brain, the marrow, the bones, the blood vessel, and wouldn't you know, the gallbladder is here again, and the gallbladder. So let's talk about all of them. We're gonna start with the uterus. So let's start with the uterus. Now, when I say the uterus in Chinese medicine, the uterus uh, word in Chinese medicine encompasses the whole female reproductive system. So don't think of just the uterus box itself, but fallopian tube, ovaries, everything, cervix, vagina, the whole gamut of reproductive system in the female part. Make sense? Okay, so that word uterus, I think, is misleading, and I like to call it the female reproductive system or the whole entity. Make sense? Okay, so all six external organs are connected to kidney and to essence. All of them. So they're very vital. It should be part of vital because they're very important. 
Now, one other thing I'm going to say about the uterus, because I get that question a lot, what happened if the person has had, had a hysterectomy? The physical organ of the uterus has been removed. Maybe the fallopian tube and ovaries are still there, which is so much better. But maybe not. Maybe they removed everything because years ago they used to remove everything. It does affect the women's hormone system. And that's why most of the time they're on hormone replacement therapy or they still get the monthly PMS that comes like a wave and flow, ebb and flow of PMS, even though they're not bleeding anymore. It does affect the body when we remove the physical organ. It does create some issue in terms of medicine perspective. However, sometimes there is no other choice. So that's what was done, right? The uterus connects to essence. So it connects to kidney for the reproductive system, of course, for conception, etc., etc. But of course, the uterus, it is part of blood, right? Because we bleed and we shed every month. So it's connected to the spleen, because spleen produces blood, the liver, because the liver stores blood, the heart, because heart circulates blood. It's connected to the chong vessel, because the chong vessel is called the sea of blood, right? Spleen 4 is for any kind of uh, menstruation issue. It's affecting the spleen. Makes sense, right? And then it connects to the dew vessel, to bringing lots of energy, lots of yang, lots of chi to the uterus. So if there is cold in the uterus, we can use do for and moxa do for, for example, and ren for to try to bring heat in the uterus. And so the ren is really connected to conception. So it's great for fertility purposes, but the do brings flow to the uterus as well. And you know, those two points are really located front and back in the same low area where the uterus is. So it kind of makes sense, right? So um, it kind of shows you the connection. So why do I talk about the connection? It's because when we want to treat issues affecting the uterus or the female reproductive system, we are going to use the ren, the du, the chong vessel, right? And we are going to use the spleen, the liver, the heart, the kidney. Make sense? Right? So this is how we go about it. We see the connection and those are the points we're going to use. We talked about the female reproductive system. Let's talk about the male counterpart, which often is called the Dantian, which is the palace of heaven, which is located below the belly button. And below the belly button is where the male reproductive system is located as well. Now the Dantian encompasses, just like for the female one, the uterus, the Dantian encompasses all the male reproductive system, including the prostate right? The testes, everything. So this is the spermatic duct, all of it, right? Testosterone, et cetera, et cetera. So think of that as the male reproductive system entity. It's in charge of creating and, and producing sperm through the essence, which connects to kidney again. So this is really an essence issue. So when it comes to the dantian or the male reproductive system, we are going to look at the kidney meridian, and kidney 10 is one that's really good for uh, the male reproductive system. However, also the liver. And liver 4 is a great point for the male reproductive system as well. Liver also moves chi. And when there is, let's say, uh, erectile dysfunction in men, it's either a kidney deficiency, so the person may be aging and there's essence depleting, and so they have a hard time with erectile dysfunction, obviously. So that's a kidney issue. If it is due to stress and it's a younger man and they have a lot of stress, lots of pressure in their job, that is a liver chi stagnation, much easier to treat, right? We can use liver and we can relax the patient so they can properly uh, function, right? So this is how we look at it. So for male reproductive system, we're going to look mostly at liver and at kidney, also at the do vessel because the do is much more young in nature and men in general are much more young because they have more testosterone versus women are more yin because they're more connected to blood and they have higher progesterone. So it makes sense? So that's the connection there for those two. Okay, so now let's look at the other one, the brain. So the six extraordinary organs are vital. We need them. And they all get affected by essence, right? So the brain, if someone is born, let's say, with Down syndrome, their essence is lower than someone that is not born with Down syndrome, right? So when it affects their brain. Autistic people, their brain is affected. Uh, Alzheimer people, their brain is affected, right? So the brain function depends on the heart, 
bringing lots of blood flow to the brain in order to be able to function properly. This is why, obviously, if we don't have oxygen and we don't have blood flow to the brain, there could be catastrophic uh, outcome for the brain. And this is also why if the brain was affected, let's say, in a car accident, it's very difficult to get back to normal and to be able to function normally um, because it depletes essence. And it's very hard when essence is affected to recover. Make sense, right? Okay, the second one is when we look at it, uh, is the, the marrow, right? So the marrow fills the bone, nourishes the brain, and contributes to making blood. We know that blood comes from marrow, right? So, so it's really connected to essence as well, because when we have marrow issue, we have bone issue, brain issue, and blood issue. So that affects all the other one in that perspective. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Okay, so the bone in Chinese medicine contain the marrow, right? Marrow is inside the bone, and it's part of the whole structure aspect of our body, including the teeth. The teeth are part of bones, and that's the relationship to essence, right? If my bones were born in a different way, for example, right, all of us are born differently, and, you know, maybe I have wider hips, that's an essence, right? Or maybe I have an extra rib, or I'm missing a rib, that's an essence. If I have my teeth that didn't grow straight, that's an essence issue, right? So bones is okay, um, you know, to look at that perspective in clinical practice. Let's see you ask someone and you say, um, have you broken a lot of bones in the past, right? So if it's once and it healed, no problem. But some people have broken a lot of bones or someone may have osteoporosis, the bones are brittling and they're 24 years old. That tells us the bones are affected by essence, so essence is affecting the bone, so essence is deficient, yes? Okay, the blood vessel, they hold the blood, right? The blood vessel hold the blood so the blood can move within and circulate within the blood vessel. They transport qi, they transport blood and nutrients to go all over the body, right? When we have our blood, our blood vessels that carry all these nutrients, the blood is made of magnesium and iron and it's nourishing the body. So when you look at the blood vessels, it's connected to essence because blood itself is, we have a type, type A, type O, right? Negative, positive, type AB, type B. That is essence. We can't change the type of blood we have and that's carried within those blood vessels. Yes? Okay. Now, the last one of the six external organ. I think, you know, I've been practicing now for 20 years and I still kind of have to really read a lot to understand why the gallbladder is in this part as well, because it does store bile, right? It's in charge of storing bile. Now, here's the thing. In Chinese culture and Chinese medicine itself, the gallbladder is seen because it stores bile and bile is this pure liquid. It's like gold liquid. It's really looked at as this anti-aging thing to be able to like have bile and, and to ingest it and eat it as this anti-aging potion kind of like, right? And that comes from a culture perspective. So the bile is seen as this pure, pure substance that is kind of like gold. And so because of that, it is connected to essence because it's that anti-aging thing that's connected to the bowel, right? Now, what's interesting too is that um, the gallbladder is the sun of the kidney in the five elements. So the five element is water, generates wood, and gallbladder is wood. So the kidney is the mother of liver and gallbladder, right? So... The gallbladder gets affected by fear very much if there is a lot of fears in the kidney. So if there's fear affecting the kidney, it's going to generate more fear for the gallbladder and the gallbladder is going to have a hard time making decision and not having courage to, um, to deal with life, to deal with event, to deal with anything, including trauma. So that's the connection to kidney and to essence. But I would say the most connection is that bile is seen as this pure, pure liquid, like gold liquid that's anti-aging, which connects to essence. One of the things that I get questioned about is what about if someone has their gallbladder removed? 
That happens all the time, right? People get gallbladder stones and they have gallbladder removed. That does definitely affect it. And I have a patient who had their gallbladder removed and since then, that's been like a few years ago, she cannot make decision. It's fantastic to see the relationship. It's so mind blowing. And that's why I love to see them because it makes so much sense. I wanted to remind you that all all that we talk about, all the graphic you saw today are all from this book. As you can see, like I have three books. You saw them behind me the whole time. But this book is where I have the Chinese medicine foundation and diagnosis. All my books come in digital version or hard copy. They ship all over the world. If they don't ship to your country, unfortunately, that does happen. Unfortunately, you can get the PDF version, which has a lot of video links to complement it. And the link of all my books is below this video. I have tons of resource on my website, resource page, tons of PDF, free courses, treatment protocols, lots of videos, lots of blog posts and courses and my books. Everything is there. Use the search bar when you're looking for something, let's say tinnitus, put it in the search bar and it'll come up for you and then you'll find it. It's super easy to use and I keep adding all the time. So definitely use my website for that.